We continue this morning in our study looking at the Holy Spirit. This is our sixth class in this series of lessons, and I really hope you've either learned or have been reminded of some just most fundamental things regarding the Holy Spirit. As I said at the outset of this study, it's not my intention to clear up um, every misconception or every um, error um, in regards to, to the Holy Spirit. I, I, it's not even my intention to answer every single answer uh, by way of the Holy Spirit. I don't have all the answers, but I do believe that we can come to a better understanding of who the Spirit, Holy Spirit is. And I do believe that we can come to an understanding of what God would have us to know about the Holy Spirit. What is his role and how does he impact us today? Because he does. You know, briefly by way of review, some just some basic fundamentals that I think really help us by way of coming to a better understanding of who the Holy Spirit um, is. The Holy Spirit is God. Um, he is deity, possesses all characteristics of deity can do what only deity can do, as we've talked about in, in, in previous classes. But the Holy Spirit is also his own personal, distinct entity. That's important as well. And then number three, the Holy Spirit is a distinct member of the Godhead. God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, without going into too much detail, as we've talked about those things in, in past lessons, those are really fundamental aspects in understanding who the Holy Spirit is. You know, last week we spent some time examining the relationship between the Holy Spirit and our Lord's chosen apostles, exploring the question, or at the very least, observing the promises that Jesus made these men specifically in regards to their possessing the Holy Spirit and their God-given role of revealing the Word of God to mankind through the Holy Spirit, as they were led by the Holy Spirit, as the Holy Spirit was poured out on them in Acts chapter 2. But much of our time was spent in John chapter 14, um, and then really through John 16, where we have some of Jesus' final instructions to his chosen apostle, his, his witnesses um, of his resurrection, his chosen men. And Jesus would tell these particular men that, that while he would ascend back to the Father, after his resurrection, he would not leave them as orphans. You remember that. Instead, he would send them another helper or comforter, depending on your version, identifying the Holy Spirit in John chapter 14 and verse 16 through 18 as the Spirit of truth. He would promise the apostles that the Holy Spirit, the helper, the comforter, would bring to remembrance all that he had taught them, John 14 and verse 26. And the Holy Spirit, through them, would testify of Christ, John 15 verses 26 and 27. And in doing so, the Holy Spirit, through the apostles, revealing the mind of God, listen to this, the result would convict the world of sin and righteousness and judgment, John chapter 16, 8 through 11. And we saw that Jesus would tell his apostles that the Holy Spirit would reveal to them the things to come, things that would take place in the future. And certainly we see these things revealed to the apostles, and, and they're recorded for us, things like our Lord's second coming, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18, or the resurrection of the dead in 1 Corinthians 15, how the sun would fall away. But then he would tell them in John 16 at verse 12, listen to this, I have many more things to say to you, but you can't bear them at present time. But when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. That's so important. For he will not speak on his own, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will disclose to you what is to come. He will glorify me, for he will take from mine and will disclose it to you. All things, verse 15, that the Father has are mine. This is why I said that he takes from mine and will disclose it to you. Jesus tells the apostles, they are the you in verse 12, in verse 13, and verse 14 and 15. The Holy Spirit would guide these men into all truth. These promises, as we studied last week, were made to the apostles in regards to the helper or comforter that would come directly to them. But here's the thing. That all truth was revealed to them, and they recorded it and preserved it for us. And no doubt we derive help. No doubt we derive comfort through the Holy Spirit. But here's the key. This takes place through the recorded word of God as was given to the apostles by the Holy Spirit. We have all truth. We need no latter-day revelation, no direct miraculous intervention 
of the Holy Spirit revealing something to us. We have all the truth. He led the apostles into all truth. It's recorded for us today. We are so blessed. So I hope those reminders were helpful. I, for a few minutes this morning, as we continue to really build on our study, I want to look at the Holy Spirit's role in man's conversion. You know, like many areas, there certainly is much error confusion, I believe, in the aspect of the Holy Spirit's work today. But let's be clear as we begin. I believe the Bible is clear. The Holy Spirit plays a most important, essential role in man's conversion. So the question becomes, how? I'm talking about a man's conversion. I'm talking about a man, a sinner who comes to a knowledge of truth and gives their life to Jesus Christ in the waters of baptism and lives faithfully until death. That's the type of conversion that I'm talking about. That's a transformational change, you would agree. But how? Let's start with the most basic and fundamental truth. You know, 1 Timothy 2 at verse 3, the apostle Paul makes abundantly clear as he's led by the Holy Spirit that God desires all men to come to a knowledge of truth and to be saved. Uh, first, that's, or first Timothy chapter 2, beginning at verse 3, this is a good and, accept, and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior. Listen to this. Who wants all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Certainly proof of this desire is expressed in God sending his son to this earth to die for the sins of all mankind. And no doubt, all members of the God has, as we have seen, played a role in man's salvation. The Bible clearly teaches that, that one must be born again, not a physical birth, as Jesus answers um, in John chapter 3, where uh, a man would crawl back into his mother's womb, but this is a spiritual birth. You remember in John chapter 3 at verse 1, it tells us there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. And this man came to Jesus at night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. And Jesus responded and said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless someone is born again, he can't see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus said to him, how can a person be born when he's old? He can't enter into his mother's womb a second time and be born, can he? And Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless someone is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Jesus makes clear to Nicodemus, someone must be born of water and the spirit. So certainly the spirit plays a role in this new birth. The apostle Paul would say in Titus 3 at verse 5, for we too, listen to this, were once foolish, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy, hateful, hating one another. But when the kindness of God our Savior and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us, not on the basis of deeds, which we did in righteousness, but accordance with his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom he richly poured out upon us through, the, through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Peter tells us when, that when a man is saved, he is regenerated and renewed by the Holy Spirit. That's the same idea of being born again in a spiritual sense, one dead in their sins, but brought back to life. Something that God does. Now, some would teach all of this takes place through a direct operation of the Holy Spirit, acting upon the heart of a sinner, all of this happening separate, apart from the Word of God. Now, it's not my goal to break down every false idea and what I believe to be error in regards to this. But here's what I'm concerned about. Understanding that the Bible clearly teaches that the Holy Spirit is involved, plays a role in man's conversion, in man's new birth. There's, there's no doubt about that. The question becomes, what does the Holy Spirit do? And how does the Holy Spirit do it? Those are important questions and will have a real world implication for all of us moving forward in our own conversion and salvation, but also as those of us who are concerned about the lost and, and our role in helping them to come to a knowledge of the truth. So, so what does the Bible say? Well, then I believe that scripture makes abundantly clear it was God's plan to save man from his sins through the medium of communicating the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now think about that. God could have done this however he wanted. He's God. But he chose the medium of preaching, communicating the gospel. In 1 Corinthians 1 at verse 21, where's the wise person? Where's the scribe? 
Where's the debater of this age? Has God not made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God. But listen to this. God was pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to do what? To save those who believe. How does God save those who believe? Through the message preached, Paul says, God chose the medium of communicating his word to the lost to save mankind, not through a direct miraculous operation of the Holy Spirit. Consider uh, just a few passages that support uh, this assertion. Jesus would say, if you have your Bibles open, go over to John chapter 17. In John 17, beginning at verse 20, notice what he says. Jesus praying says, I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those also who believe in me, but listen to what he says, through their word. If you go on to John chapter 20, at verse 30, John 20, at verse 30, Jesus would say, therefore many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these have been written, he says, so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. These things have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ. Romans chapter 1, a passage we quote often, Romans chapter 1, beginning at verse 16. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, Paul says, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Romans 10 at verse 17. Romans 10 at verse 17. So faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. And then we can go over to 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 1, and look with me there at verse 23. Paul Peter says, For you have been born again, not of seed which is perishable, perishable but imperishable. That is, through the living and enduring word of God. So certainly, brethren, when, when you take those passages together, it becomes obvious that the word of God is essential to one believing, leading to salvation. This, this change, this transformation that takes place. The gospel of Christ is the power of God to salvation for those who believe. Faith, it comes by hearing the word of God. James 1 verse 21 tells us that the implanted word, when received with meekness, is able to save one's soul. So obviously, the word of God communicated to the lost is the medium of God's choosing to bring man into a saved condition. The gospel transforms and changes the hearts of men. So someone says, but what about the Holy Spirit? Well, I, I hope this is going to be easy for us to accept because we've laid the groundwork in previous classes. What about the Holy Spirit? Well, we got to make this connection. What does the word do? What does the Holy Spirit do? What the Word does, the Holy Spirit does. Remember, the Word was delivered and revealed by the Holy Spirit. The first Peter 1 at verse 12, it was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves but you. In these things which now have been announced to you through those who preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels, angels long to look. Let me say that again. Through those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Think about it. When those inspired men were communicating the gospel, the Holy Spirit was at work. And in the same way today, when God's word is preached, the Holy Spirit is working. For example, consider the 3,000 saved on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2. Think about what happened that day. Now, we know the Holy Spirit was poured out on the apostles, and the Spirit gave them the words to speak. And Jews from all over are gathered in Jerusalem, and they heard the Holy Spirit's message proclaimed by the apostles. What pricked their heart? Verse 37 says, when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart, said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what are we to do? It says when they heard this. What's the this? The this is the words that the apostles proclaimed from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was acting on the apostles by way of giving them the word of God. The word of God revealed 
to these people through the apostles by the Holy Spirit was what pierced their heart and changed them. In John 16 at verse 8, remember what Jesus said the Holy Spirit would do. And he, that's the Spirit, when he comes, he will convict the world regarding sin and righteousness and judgment. And that's exactly what we see happening in the book of Acts. What changed the hearts of these men? Again, the gospel given to the apostles by the Holy Spirit. The word of God changed these men. The Holy Spirit converted these men through the message of God. You know, in just a few chapters over, the same thing happens with the Ethiopian eunuch. The Spirit certainly played a role in this man's conversion. You remember the Holy Spirit told Philip to go. The Holy Spirit took Philip to the man. But what happened next? What changed the heart of the eunuch? The gospel was preached, not some direct operation of the Holy Spirit directly taking over the eunuch's heart. It was the gospel preached as was revealed by the Holy Spirit to Philip. You know, so many today, they desire some grand experience when it comes to one's conversion. As if the word of God being preached as revealed to us by the apostles through the Holy Spirit is not enough. It's the gospel that changes man's heart. And certainly the Holy Spirit plays a role in our salvation. He appeals to mankind through the word of God, not through miracles or emotion. We know we're not saved based on a feeling, but as a result of accepting God's grace as revealed to us by the Spirit through the apostles in the word recorded for us on his terms, as the Holy Spirit has revealed it to us. And I'll tell you what I'm reminded of and what I, I'm going to do with this. Brethren, this book that you have in front of you, it is so powerful. The Holy Spirit has revealed the mind of God. God's grace, His promises. And when the honest heart comes and is connected or encounters this wonderful news for the sinner, it's powerful. And it changes the hearts of men and ultimately saves them. And there's no doubt God does the saving. But we must respond to God's grace and his terms by faith as revealed to us in his word by the Spirit. So let's talk more about this next week. I want to go a little deeper with this as we consider the Holy Spirit and the Christian. What about after one's conversion. Does the Holy Spirit play a role then? Let's talk about that next week. Thank you all, as always, for joining me. Uh, Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, Father, we are so thankful. Father, we're thankful for the Holy Spirit revealing your mind to us. Father, we can have zero doubt whether or not you are pleased with us through your word. And Father, we derive great comfort and strength from that. Father, for your promises revealed to us by the Spirit, we are so thankful. They sustain us. They provide us perspective. They give us hope. Father, we need you right now. Our world needs you. Our country needs you. Your people need you. Father, you have answered our prayers. And Father, while we have lost and while we have hurt, we continue to trust that you know best, that your way is perfect. And Father, we're just so thankful for you. Bless all who are hurting. Bless those who are struggling. Bless those who are struggling to make sense of all that is going on. Father, give us an opportunity to minister to them. Give us an opportunity to share your word with them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.